there are various different strategies that organisms in a particular <coughs> level of food chain or the like may take. For example, predators, you can be very active running around chasing things, or there's the ambush lurk and wait. So for example, this crab spider is hanging out on a flower and actually some of these actually can take, change their color so it's blending in nicely with the flower and it's hoping for some insect to come along to try to pollinate the flower and the spider will grab it and eat it. <clears throat> there are other things that take the ambush approach. This is standard, for example, among crocodilians. The common approach being to <clears throat> sit there in the water looking like just some old log until something comes close to it. That's the ambush strategy as well. Sometimes they do even more than that. Alligators have been observed kind of balancing a branch across their nose while sitting there in the water. And it's been suspected that perhaps they are hoping that a large wading bird will come along and see that stick and decide to try grabbing it to make the nest and the alligator try grabbing the bird. <coughs> Various strategies there. What about on the defense side? There are quite a number of possible ways that an organism can try to defend itself to keep from being eaten by a predator. These may be physical features. Uh, plants often have some sort of spikes on them with, that they're technically spines or thorns or prickles. <clears throat> uh, hard parts. It's hard to crunch through a skeleton than something all soft and squishy. <clears throat> Whether this is, say, wood or bone or shell or the hard outer skeleton of an insect, things like that. Just plain sides. No matter how hungry you are feeling, you probably would not go up and, and try to take a bite out of an elephant. <coughs> the elephant would not be happy, and <coughs> that bite is not going to incapacitate the elephant, it will only annoy it. <coughs> uh, elephants are so big, there are very few animals able to actually try to eat them. Of course, being too small, that can also be a way of avoiding some types of predators. Chemical defenses. <clears throat> you don't want to eat something that tastes bad, definitely not something that tastes like it might be poisonous. <clears throat> and so there's quite a wide range of organisms that use chemicals as a defense. Uh, in fact, a lot of the things that we think of as spices are defense chemicals from the plant trying to prevent things from eating them, but humans have developed a taste for liking those particular ones, as well as things that we think aren't so great. In turn, if an organism is able to tolerate some chemical in its food, it may be able to store that from the food and use it for its own defense. Uh, for example, quite a number of the insects that have distasteful chemical are getting them from their food. Monarch butterflies, the caterpillar eats milkweed. Milkweed makes some chemicals that not too many things like to eat. But those that do, whether it's our monarch caterpillars or certain types of beetles and bugs, they <clears throat> pick up those chemicals from the milkweed and have them in them and thus are not tasty to predators, and so they tend to be relatively conspicuous in their color pattern, saying, <clears throat> look, I am something bad to eat. Uh, we even have a type of bird in New Guinea that feeds on insects that get <clears throat> toxic chemicals <clears throat> from their food. And so going up the food chain, you get the toxins there, and the bird is something that 
things don't want to eat. Behaviors. Oh, one obvious thing, there's a predator. Run! <coughs> uh, if you get away, works. On the other hand, fight back. <laughs> Be aggressive. <clears throat> Hiding. <coughs> that can work well. Or, if the predator is far enough away, and I see you <clears throat> type of message to the predator may be helpful. Uh, for example, some antelope in Africa <clears throat> have a behavior where they jump straight up. That kind of makes them obvious, but a little higher up they can see further. And also, that's kind of saying, okay, Mr. Lion over there, I've seen you. You come closer, and I'll run away. <clears throat> then we both wasted our time. <clears throat> Don't bother. So you get this signaling back and forth where the prey is saying, I am alert and watching. Or, for example, you may have noticed the geese over by Lake Hollowfield. Typically, a lot of geese may not seem to be paying much attention, but there's at least one standing watching around not only is it noticing things, it's conspicuous. You can see there's an alert goose and trying to sneak up on them probably won't work. There are also a variety of types of camouflage possible to help with hiding. <coughs> Some camouflage makes things difficult to find. For example, the <coughs> color of the front wings and head body of this Carolina grasshopper look a lot like good old Carolina dirt. <coughs> when this grasshopper is standing on a patch of dirt around here, we have them on campus at this part of the world, they are not easy to see. Another option is to look like danger. <coughs> Anybody want to grab this insect here? It actually will not sting. This is a bee. This is not a bee. Sorry. This is a fly. If you look very closely, you see one pair of wings and in the shadow, bees have two pairs of wings. This is a fly. The eyes are kind of funny for a bee. <clears throat> You've got a few clues there, but it's a well-disguised one. And so animals that have learned that they don't want to mess with bees, see that? They're not going to mess with that either. Uh, complication, there are things you might do to try to confuse a predator. For example, <coughs> flash colors. When the grasshopper's wings are closed, you can't see the back wings. <coughs> when it's normally <coughs> just walking or sitting somewhere. But when it opens them, all of a sudden you've got this bright yellow, <coughs> very contrasting band there. A couple of things that might do. For one thing, all of a sudden, whoa, what was that? You kind of startle, confuse the predator. That may give a moment extra to escape. Or the predator, hey, I see something yummy looking flying there. It's got <clears throat> black and yellow and white. Okay, and where'd it go? When the grasshopper lands, folds the wings, those colors suddenly disappear. <coughs> And the predator that was watching those colors can be confused. A similar type of trick is having an eye spot. <clears throat> this serves two possible <clears throat> ways of defense. For one thing, if something looks like a great big eye or pair of eyes, <clears throat> predator sees that. Uh, wait, is that something even bigger looking back at me? Maybe that's going to eat me. <coughs> so it may scare the predator if the predator thinks that it might be the eye of a yet larger predator. Or if the predator decides that it is going to try to eat it, the quicker your prey is dead, the less likely it is to do something to hurt you. <coughs> so 
<coughs> predators tend to try to go for a quick kill, at least for anything that can possibly <coughs> significantly fight back. Uh, if you want to kill something, <coughs> if you bite its face off, it's probably not doing real great. It's pretty important. <coughs> so, predator aiming for the hen is quite common. And so if a predator sees an eye spot and, aha, there's its face, and tries biting that, but the eye spot's actually, say, on the tip of the tail or way on the edge of the wing or something, then the predator's attack may be much less damaging and the prey is able to escape. Warning coloration. <clears throat> if a predator encounters a what it hopes to be prey and has problems, uh, predators often can remember that and try to avoid it next time. <clears throat> and so conspicuous colors, like the B pattern that the fly was taking advantage of, are a common way to warn <clears throat> I am not a good target. You see me, you want to leave me alone. So warning or episematic coloration. <clears throat> and this in turn can lead to two different types of situations. <clears throat> Batesian mimicry is when something like that fly there, that would be perfectly edible if you like flies, <clears throat> looks like a bee. It looks like something bad, but it is not. So, you have the mimic, not defended, is protected from predators by resembling the model species that is dangerous. <clears throat> Mullerian <clears throat> mimicry, on the other hand, is where you have multiple species that all are something the predator does not want, and they look similar to each other. What's the advantage there? Well, if one, let's say, frog <coughs> just come from being a tadpole and <coughs> has metamorphosed, is just learning to eat bugs, <coughs> hey, I see a bug. It's bright yellow and black. I can aim my tongue right at that easy. Ow! <coughs> okay, stay away from bright yellow and black bugs. <clears throat> Maybe that was a bumblebee? Maybe it was a yellow jacket? <clears throat> there are a lot of different things that it could have been. And the frog's keeping away from all of them now. So, by having the Mullerian mimicry, the multiple unpleasant species <clears throat> can distribute the cost of predators learning across all the species, and they all benefit from the predator learning to avoid them. Here's an example. These are snakes. The coral snake here is our one member of the cobra family found in our general part of the world. It's rather rare and declining. There's not been one seen in North Carolina for quite some years now, as far as I know. <coughs> this is the scarlet king snake. It is not venomous at all, but you see the color pattern looks rather similar, and so animals that know to avoid a coral snake will also tend to stay away from the scarlet king snake. <clears throat> uh, now for our local ones, the old rhyme is about <clears throat> red and yellow kill a fellow, <clears throat> red and black venom lack. Uh, that doesn't necessarily work when you get on into the tropics. There are other coral snakes with different patterns. <coughs> but for our part of the world, <coughs> eastern U.S., that does work. So <coughs> here's Batesian, harmless, mimicking the venomous. Mullerian 
is when both of them are things you want to stay away from, but you only have to memorize one pattern because it applies to both of them. So here we have a monarch butterfly and a viceroy butterfly, and both of them birds don't like so much, and so having a similar pattern, the birds can learn to avoid both of them. <clears throat> Although, um, they don't entirely, <clears throat> not all birds refuse to eat either species, but <clears throat> they seem to be less popular and to be somewhat avoided. And it's a complication that seems like the monarch is worse tasting, and <clears throat> so <clears throat> there may be a degree of is it sort of Batesian, sort of Mullerian? The caterpillar showed two rather different approaches, though. A monarch caterpillar is relatively colorful, bright stripy on the milkweed plant, so it's pretty easy to see. And it's advertising. I am full of milkweed toxins. You do not want to try eating me. Viceroy caterpillar, on the other hand, <coughs> has kind of... <coughs> black and white splotchy look. A kind of black and white splotch on a leaf. Uh, that looks like something left behind by the passing bird. <coughs> How many things want to eat bird poop? Not many. So the caterpillar, by looking like something that predators do not want, <clears throat> gets protection that way. 